Um, good morning, and welcome to the Teaching Learning Committee uh, a meeting today. I apologize for um, starting up a little um, a 10 minutes late. That's not our norm. Um, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to diving in. Um, before we begin, though, I do want to uh, yield the floor um, to Sean Conley, our Chief Academic Officer. Good morning, Commissioners. Hi. Um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to quickly share. Last week we had our first special education institute and we had 200 participants and we had a wait list of over 100 uh, teachers as well. Uh, this year was different than years in the past and we, had, we invited general education teachers, special education teachers, IEP chairs, as well as administrators. And throughout the four days uh, they engaged in topics such as IEP development, IEP implementation, legal matters, as well as SST. Uh, I was only able to attend one day, but within like the three hours that I was there, and again, I just want to acknowledge the team mm -hmm. for their hard work because it was a truly incredible week. I had at least 15 teachers and administrators come up to me and just thank me for uh, making special ed a focus. The experience that they received with the special ed team, they just stuck was incredible. There was one teacher there that said her mother was the former CAO a long, long, long time ago and that we are just continuing her mother's work. <laughs> so it, it was just a truly incredible uh, week. Um, I cannot, there's so many people to acknowledge and thank for the work that they did and I don't want to even start that because I know I will miss someone and that's not not fair, but I definitely want to acknowledge Macon Tucker as well as our new executive director, uh, Deborah Brooks, for the work that they've started and the work that we ended last year with and continuing already and building upon that. And I just wanted to acknowledge that today in the Teaching and Learning Committee. Wonderful. Wonderful. And we're going to hear a little bit later on about the, C, uh, the, the Special Ed Institute as well. So, um, so that's fabulous. Um, okay. Uh, we're going to, we're going to, um, kick off the meeting. Um, one thing on the agenda is we do have a lot of procurement items actually to talk through and so I think 15 minutes isn't going to be enough so and we're starting a little bit late so I'll be a little bit of a traffic cop as we do we have the SER school effectiveness reviews school readiness and assessment strategy so I think the general norm is about 15 minutes of presentation 15 to 20 minutes even if you have a longer PowerPoint to kind of get through it and then we'll ask questions and then move on. Uh, so kind of uh, that, that's kind of how the, we'll, 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 we'll work the meeting. So 2017-18 um, school effectiveness reviews. Okay. One of the best practices that we do as a district that we started and then have spread through the district. So I love this report that Ms. Perkins Cohen's was very, very instrumental in developing. But I love this presentation. Just a fan. Just a fan. <laughs> So again, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Teresa Jones. I serve as our Chief Achievement and Accountability Officer. We also have Ms. Brianna Kaufman, who's going to be presenting this, the School Effectiveness Review update today. I just want to remind everyone that this is an annual review that we share with the board and with the public. It's intended to provide an update on what we were able to, to discern from our reviews that were conducted in the prior year, but also to talk about the continual improvement in the process and the plans for the upcoming year. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brianna. Mm -hmm. okay, perfect. All right. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead. I'm sure everybody is familiar. I'm sure everybody is familiar with the and School I'm Effectiveness very sorry, Review. But your mic was turned off when you introduced yourself. Can you reintroduce yourself? Sure. Please? I'm so sorry. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> my name is Brianna Kaufman. I'm the manager of the School Effectiveness Review team. And um, I'm going to start off by just talking about the School Effectiveness view, Review Overview. Um, I'm sure everybody is familiar with the SCR. It has been in the district for since 2010. Um, our process has not changed over the years, but um, our protocol has been tweaked, um, although it has not changed since 2014-15. So just a, a quick overview, it is a qualitative review. So we're on site um, for two days gathering evidence. We're looking at four specific domains and 12 key action items. We gather evidence in three ways, through focus groups, through classroom observations, and document review. We're then coming to um, developing findings based on the evidence, and then ultimately each of those key actions do get, uh, does get a rating on a four-point scale. One of the things that I do want to point out in this slide is something that we began in 2013-14, which is called prioritization. And this is a half-day action planning session that we do immediately following the SER. 
So it's an opportunity for schools to really <clears throat> delve into the um, evidence and the findings and then pick one area of growth for improvement and then create a short-term action plan around that. So before we get into the trends or the findings um, from the school year, I want to give you a little bit of context. So we did visit 33 schools this past year. Of those schools, 13 of them were charter schools, nine priority schools, and then we did see one separate public day school. As I mentioned, this process has been around since uh, 2010, so most schools have been through an SER before, if not once, sometimes twice. So I did want to give you a little bit of information about when these schools had last been reviewed. You'll notice that in 1617, we did have three schools that were going through an SER for the very first time. That is because two of them are new charter schools, so they'll be going through the renewal process for the first time. And the other one is that sep separate public day school that I mentioned. So you may remember last year, we actually visited all of the separate public day schools as a cohort. Unfortunately, one of the schools we were unable to see last year, so we made sure we reviewed them this year. So that's why there's an outlier. <clears throat> So this next slide is really meant to give you a 30,000 foot view of the data from this cohort of schools. So again, we look at four specific uh, domains, highly effective instruction, talented people, vision, engagement, and strategic leadership. Under each of those domains are some key action items. And this um, shows the average rating per key action per domain for all of our schools. But as we always say in the SCR, numbers only tell part of the picture, so we really need to dive in deeper to truly understand what that means. So here we're um, looking at some of the trends that we can conclude from our, our evidence. So the first area of strength is that schools are really using the Common Core State Standards to guide instruction, and we saw and heard about that alignment of standards to the tasks. Um, that was a push and a focus from the district. We also consistently heard about um, schools using the cycles of professional uh, learning, um, that focus being on close reading this past year, and really incorporating that into their instructional vision and then providing professional development around that to their, their staff. Another area is that schools consistently um, were involved in engaging families and community stakeholders in the school. So they communicated with them in a variety of ways. And we heard about flyers, robocalls, text messages, using apps such as the Living Tree, Class Dojo, website, and then also translating documents into other languages when necessary. And then finally, as an area of strength, we found that teachers are meeting on a regular basis, either by grade or content, and they're using that time to discuss data, and then often they're also talking about those cycles of professional learning during that time to improve instruction. For areas of improvement, um, we would hear about teachers planning or talking about differentiation and small groups, using accommodations and modifications, and we would even see that sometimes within the classes. But when we look at the lesson plans, we didn't always consistently see that noted within lesson plans. So as a district, I think we're getting really strong on using those teach indicators from our instructional framework, but that those plan indicators are sometimes um, still not quite there. We also heard consistently about mentoring programs for early um, career teachers, but where we saw the inconsistency is sometimes those mentoring programs were more informal. Um, so not having consistent meetings or um, not always uh, kind of knowing exactly who their mentor was. Um, we also sometimes found that they only focused on first year teachers, so sometimes not providing that consistent support to those second and third year teachers. We also found that um, for students, sometimes there is a lack of exposure to other cultures, either through the curriculum, through resources, uh, field trips. Um, and then also, we found that sometimes there was a lack of programs available to students and families in need. So an example of that would be like a uniform bank or, or a food pantry. And then we also found that sometimes there were no foreign languages offered for those Comar-specific grades. The last bullet is around budget distribution and resource allocations, and we kind of look at this very specifically with the SCR. And so we found that, um, that there was not consistent um, sufficient staffing, technology, or materials and supplies 
um, for, uh, to support teaching and learning. So an example of this would be if a school's goal was to increase the park scores, but we heard that teacher, uh, teachers, students, and parents felt like they weren't exposed to technology on a regular basis, then they, then that may not, the technology was not sufficiently supporting their goal to increase the park scores. The next slide, I'm going to talk about Key Action 1.2. So this comes directly from our classroom observations. So um, while we're on site, we are seeing 60% of the classes at, um, within a school, and we are only in the classroom for 20 minutes. We're using um, a tool that is aligned with the instructional framework, and we're specifically looking on for this uh, key action. We're looking at teach one through six. We did see, or, I'm sorry, we also are looking at seven, uh, 17 specific indicators, whether they were observed or not observed. We did see um, over the course of the year, we saw 360 classrooms. And so some of the strengths that we were able to um, identify, those three bullets, you will see that all three bullets can be attributed, again, to that focus on standard-based lesson objectives and the district's work around the instructional core. Um, this has been a major push around, again, around implementing the Common Core State Standards and ensuring that tasks are aligned to the standards and objectives. If we look at the area of growth, those three bullets, they all speak to a need to infuse rigor within the instruction. So making sure that there are opportunities and time for students to grapple with complex text and tasks. Um, having teachers ask questions requiring students to justify side evidence or explain their thought process and then having teachers engage students in discussion with their peers to promote an increase in understanding of the content. I think the really exciting thing about these growths is that they actually are all aligned um, to the cycle of professional learning goal for this coming school year, which is building a bridge between academic reading and academic writing through strengthening communication skills, both orally and written. So I anticipate that because the district is taking such a, a focus and, and providing additional support to schools around these areas of growth, that we should be able to see some improvement for next year. <clears throat> now I really want to focus in prioritization. As I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, this is something that we um, began back in 13-14. We piloted um, in a couple of schools. In these last two years, we've done full implementation of prioritization with all schools except charter schools. And so um, this really, prioritization really focuses on, um, or is aligned, I'm sorry, to the CEO's focus area of leadership, providing all staff members with opportunities to grow as leaders who in, improve outcomes for students by connecting with, empowering, and championing them. So prioritization, as I mentioned, um, immediately follows the SCR process, and it really um, helps principals with that now what, right? So it's providing real-time formative feedback to school leaders based on the evidence gathered during their SCR. It's giving them time to process that information. So we block off three hours um, for school leadership to sit down with them to go over the evidence and details and the findings. And so they have time to kind of process that information. And then we provide guidance and around creating an action plan to address one of those areas uh, for improvement. So this is something I really just feel very passionate about, that the SER um, process is really um, a, just a value add for principals. After each prioritization session, um, we give a survey to all the participants. Um, and participants may include the principal. We ask them to involve some teachers, if possible, other staff. And then we also invite district staff as well. So their ILAD, their ACL, somebody from the turnaround office. Um, and so this is some of the feedback that we received from their survey. I just want to point out uh, bullet number three, which is 93% of participants felt prioritization session was very beneficial or beneficial. And then the next slide, um, we always have a principal feedback session, and this is just a quote from one of our principals about prioritization. So I'm just going to give you a few minutes to read it over on your own. And then I just want to point out some of the key words, um, impactful, deep dive, laser-like focus, feedback cycle, 
actionable feedback. And then the last sentence, we need more of this type of interactions as school leaders. So now I'm going to kind of switch gears, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the process improvements for the upcoming year, 1718. So as I mentioned, um, that the prioritization is um, aligned with the CEO's uh, focus area of leadership. Um, we really wanted to capitalize on that because we do feel like that's a strong component of the, our process. And so when thinking about our schools for this year, we wanted to think about them a little bit differently. So the first criteria we always use are what schools are going are up for charter renewal the next year, so in 1819. So we have those schools um, right off the bat. The next criteria we look at is time. So we are trying to keep schools on a pretty regular uh, rotation of every three to four years. But then after that, we need to have some kind of criteria on how we're prioritizing which schools we're going to see. So this year, we're looking at principal tenure. And we're looking at it in two different ways. So the first way is because we do feel like this is really valuable feedback to them to help them grow as a leader. We, if a principal was at a school for less than two years, we wanted to prioritize them first to get an SCR. Because even if they've had 10 years of being a principal, you know, experience being a principal, if they're new to that school, they need to understand that school community in greater context. And we feel like the SCR does that. The next thing we did is we looked at principals that had been at the same school since their last SCR visit and then looked at those ratings. So if they had a lot of developings and we felt that they had area for growth or improvement, we wanted to come back and, we, and, and review them again to see if they've made any progress in growth. Also in 1314, when they had this process, they may not have went through a prioritization. So this would be another um, form of support to provide those principals. Another process improvement that we're making for this upcoming year is we're going to extend the visit length. So we're going to add a half a day or four hours. So um, in the past, the visit has always just been a two-day site visit. This year, it will be a two-and-a-half-day site visit. And we have multiple reasons for why we've decided to do this. The first one is to really have our team engage in a thorough review of documentation. So we never know what we're going to get until we show up at the school um, on day one. Um, and so sometimes we have received 40 binders, 60 binders of documentation that the school has put together. And we want to make sure that we're providing um, adequate review of all of those documentations. And so this will allow us to do that. The other um, key point is to make sure that we're engaging with all stakeholders in focus groups. So sometimes when we go to a larger school, such as a high school, it's difficult to make sure that we're hearing from all teachers because we have a limited amount of time. Um, also with charter schools, we have two additional focus groups, an operator focus group and a board focus group. So again, making sure that we're hearing from all stakeholders, um, we just wanted to provide additional time to ensure that that is happening. Um, the next bullet is around the classroom visit tool, which um, we'll, I'll talk about in my next slide. But we have um, developed a new classroom visit tool that we'll be implementing this school year. And so because it's a new tool, we want to make sure that we're being, being very thoughtful and thorough with it. And so we wanted to provide extra time for our team to norm and share examples around that tool. So we're capturing accurate data. We're also making sure that we um, have extended time for our team meeting. So this is the debrief at the end of the day um, that our team will talk about the evidence that we found, identify any additional questions, and then making sure that we come to consensus. So these are just some of the reasons um, why we have decided to uh, extend the day, also ensuring that renewal reviews capture the information necessary to inform high stakes decisions. And then the last um, process improvement, which I touched on just a minute ago, is the classroom visit tool. So previously, our tool was a binary tool. Um, it was either observed or not observed, um, looking at uh, 27 specific indicators. And SchoolWorks, which is the organization that originally helped us develop the SCR process in the district, um, recently switched from a binary tool to a point scale. 
And so um, this actually this work actually started last summer. Uh, we engaged them to talk to them about what does that look like? How does that work? What are the benefits to that? Um, after we engaged them to find out uh, how they did their process, we then um, collaborated with uh, teaching and learning to form a CVT work group in which we reevaluated the instructional framework and made sure that our new tool was aligned. And uh, you will see in the new tool, our language is actually more um, directly related to the instructional framework. Um, we also, we, you know, we wanted to build this out to where it is giving more rich information to principals. So after we developed the tool, we then went into about four different schools to pilot the tool, um, making sure that it works for our students, making sure that the indicators that we have identified are highly observable and happen frequently. And then um, we had a teacher focus group and also a principal focus group in which we received feedback about the tool. So I'm really excited about this new tool. Principals seem to be really excited as well and really felt like it was going to be a positive thing um, to, to have that more rich context about what's actually happening in their school. And then one piece of feedback I'll just give you with the principals. Um, uh, you'll see on the three-point scale we have evident, partially evident, not evident. They actually helped us um, based on their feedback, we uh, modified that. It, it was met, partially met, not met, but that was one of the things that they kind of said, hey, that doesn't really make a lot of sense because the teacher may have met it, it just after your 20 minutes. So we, um, based on their feedback, adjusted it to say evident, partially evident, and not evident. So again, those are just some of the um, highlights of uh, process improvements for 1718, and that is the end. Thank you. And great modeling, 15 minutes, uh, <laughs> wonderful, thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner Hyde Hubbard or Commissioner Berkeley, questions? Yeah, I have a couple. Um, first question, I, so this is fantastic. I've always loved the SER, so thank you for the thorough presentation. Um, question, how does the public understand what happens in an SER? We've talked about what the schools get out of it and the principals get out of it. How do our parents, how do our community folks understand what's happening at our schools to better have good data about like, maybe I want to choose a different school. How do I know as a public member what happens in these SERs? That's a great question. Um, we actually have all of our reports uh, posted online and also within this PowerPoint, those are all hyperlinked. So I encourage everybody to go online and to um, download reports. Uh, we hope we write them in user-friendly language. So we hope that they're easy for parents or community members to understand. Um, I talk about them all the time when I'm out in the public. Um, and you know, I would love uh, for parents and, and community members to um, know about them more. But I would say that also we ask that school, uh, the schools share the results of the SCRs after um, the visit is done. So again, a lot of our schools, we receive uh, from principal feedback that they do share them within PTO or their school family council meetings. Um, they may not give them the whole report to re read because it is a lot, but they will give them the highlights from the review. Yeah, I don't know that everybody knows that they're accessible. Is there, when, when you go to our website, is it, is it sort of obvious where I would go to look for this? Unfortunately, I don't think it is. Yeah. Um, I think you have to type in, this is how I get to it, I type in school effectiveness review and that and you pulls find, it yeah. up. Yeah. And can we, let's work with um, communications if we can try to figure out how to make that more obvious yeah. to folks okay. so they can find it. And, and I work in the link community. link it through the school profile or some way. Yeah, right. should be when you call the right. school profile. Because yeah. I, yeah. I work yeah. in the community with schools all the time and I don't think anyone has talked about this and mm -hmm. it's such a valuable tool. I just want to make sure we're having access to it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. My second question is on slide 10, um, uh, second bullet, number two. Well, you talk about sort of deciding the selection criteria for doing the SERs, and I understand sort of the rationale behind if they've had a three, one, three, or four years prior, and maybe didn't determine additional feedback was necessary. I'm a little bit concerned about that, only because we're supposed to be constant learners, and even our best schools could always be better. And so I'm just wondering, what's the rationale behind not just sort of doing a regular cycle where all schools get reviewed every three or four years? 
given that, you know, even some of our high flying schools may need to do special ed better or students of color better or gifted and advanced learning better. I mean, there's always room for improvement at every school. So mm -hmm. rationale behind that. Yep. So we are on a three to four year um, rotation. Um, so this is just unfortunately we are only a team of four. Mm -hmm. So we have a limited capacity of how many schools we can do each year. So this was just a way to prioritize which schools we do this year. Next year, those other schools that did not make the cut this year will gotcha. automatically be um, gotcha. top on the list for next year. So you have a team of 433 yes. SCR. That's amazing. I'm sorry. Can we just stop for a minute? That's amazing. <laughs> that's that's fantastic work. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm done. Sorry. Thanks. I actually was going to uh, build on that. Um, not only the number, but what I've. It's a real important to connect it to the school leadership pipeline development piece as uh, you know I used to run new leaders uh, back years ago and we had our resident principals who participated in the mm -hmm. SER and I have to say the feedback they got to go into different schools to kind of understand to kind of capture and deliver feedback was just really an incredible experience so I would just think about and I so can you just talk a little bit about the teams that go because it's not just you four going out right yep. you still are you still have a diverse team and I just absolutely I want to hear about that thing and Okay, hear about that. Number two is like how many? Is it about 30 a year is the question. And then how, just talk to me about the teams, like who's on the teams and is there any way to kind of diversify and give more leadership experiences to our um, people who are interested in this type of thing? Yep, that's great. So the last three years, um, well, the last two years and then this coming year, um, we have been around 35 is our average. Um, before that, we were in more like the 60s, but that's when we had a team of six. So unfortunately, when um, the reduction of staff a couple years ago, um, that reduces our capacity. So around 35 is the average. Um, our teams vary depending on the size of the school. So as I mentioned, those larger high schools will have a, a team up to six people. Um, and we do rely heavily on the district staff um, to support our work. So it has been great that we have gotten um, staff from all different offices, teaching and learning, special ed, um, turnaround office. And they have all been great team members. And so what we do every year is we send out an all call of like, you know, please help support the, the SER. Um, we have people volunteer for the, these visits. And then we provide them a training on um, their responsibilities uh, as a team member. And then they help support us. So it's been really great. Um, the new leaders for new school principal residents, we have had that partnership probably at least the last four years, maybe five. Um, and they have been terrific team members. We absolutely love working with them. Um, and I think it's extremely valuable for them as well. Um, the, the feedback that I've received from them is, you know, because a lot of them, they're going into a school next year, right? So to go through this process as a team member, to see it from that side, and then be able to then take that information and implement it in their school. Um, we have thought about, you know, how can we diversify? That is something that we are currently working on. Um, some ideas have been tapping into assistant principals or principals. I think the tough part about principals being team members is to pull them out of their school building for two days. And that's been the, the major concern or roadblock um, that yeah, we've had. Yeah, and the thing I would just jump in there is, uh, whether it's teacher leaders or assistant principals, and I know two days is a huge commitment, but I actually have seen incredible prof professional learning. And if you all could think about, I mean, it's obviously your call, just like um, think about that could be like release days for their professional growth and development to go and be part of an SCR team would increase our bandwidth because I think this, and I, what I really like is the prioritization that it's not overwhelming feedback. There's a laser, there's a kind of, there's a, deep dive topic yep. that you can, and I think this is exactly kind of feedback schools are saying they want. So um, I just something to think about. I just want to add to that, that the, the pulling a principal out of school for two days who is really struggling might actually really benefit that principal. Mm -hmm. They might be able to go back to their school and think about what they're doing in a different way, if especially if they're going to a school that has a really sort of high level functioning school and sort of witnessing that in a really deep dive way, I'd be very, very beneficial to that principal. Okay. Um, my, my last question is, um, how, just remind me how this feedback is used for school evaluation. You know, maybe, um, it, it, does it go into the principal feed? It, this is still a piece of feedback that is used for learning growth, but not evaluation. Correct. At the school level or the principal level. Correct. And that's the purpose. That's the intent. Mm -hmm. 
right? It uh -huh. is, and it's I'm also at the chief academic <laughs> officer. Is there any any thought of? I'm not saying. I, I just want to state right. that that this is for learning, growth, and development. It's not evaluative. That is that is correct, and it's also if we're, it's evaluative for charters and the charter uh, renewals, but not. Correct, and, and part of that also has to do with the rotation because schools are only being evaluated once every three to four years. And we think about evaluation really being an annual process for employees, just thinking about what's the relationship between those two. One of the reasons that we have been successful in using it as part of the charter process is because that's looking at multiple years of performance. So the renewal process allows for something like a qualitative review to be included as a key component. Yeah, it's just an interesting thing to ponder, and with a principal, like for principal evaluation, eventually over time, is it something that could be an indicator? And I know that it's once every three or four years, but if we added bandwidth, then we did this every two years. That this would be part of feedback and, and growth over time. Um, I, I don't have a perspective on it, but I just think it's so valuable, and it, it, we then want to make sure that people are acting on the feedback that's given. So, um, a lot to think about. But thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, wonderful, welcome. Uh, please introduce yourself, uh, school readiness. Uh, School is around the corner, as my, <laughs> as my middle school son is uh, telling me, um, <laughs> lamenting and not liking the back to school commercials. Uh, go ahead. Last days of summer. Good morning again, Commissioner. My name is Sean Conley. I'm the Chief Academic Officer. And I'm Casey Mangle, the Special Assistant to the Chief Academic Officer. Um, our three-year academic goal, as we've stated many times uh, in our Teaching and Learning Committee, is by 2020, all students will have access to complex texts and tasks, be able to think and analyze information critically in order to create a cohesive, evidence-based argument and be able to communicate uh, with confidence and conviction. Um, for the past couple of years, uh, I've made commitments to the field, teachers and principals, and one of those uh, commitments that I made uh, in June at the CAO Institute was around um, increasing and improving uh, professional learning opportunities across the district. And you have seen the coherency model in the past, and this is a model which uh, helps describe how our district staff as well as uh, our teachers and leaders experiencing professional learning across the district is grounded in, in content learning and adult practices and by the end of a cycle our teachers our leaders and district staff all should experience content in a very similar way and we believe that this will help us uh, achieve our goal uh, currently we have a cross-functional uh, Yeah, I read it this morning, <laughs> but I didn't. That what we're seeing right now on our computer is a completely different deck. Yeah, so maybe we should just, as board members, look at re re read the TV. We're doing. I was just sending an email to. Uh, well, that's the Amanda one. Yeah, there, there's that's one for tonight academic? that is around operations. I, I this is an instructional that. academic. No, I, don't, I, I don't have that. All right, we're a little Make bit, sure. you know, hampered because okay. we have the spirit. But I, re I actually have read this. this I've read this proposal. I've read this, but I, it, I don't. I don't see it right now. Like it's not in board docs right now. So how did you read it then? I don't know. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> 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 no, but I, this morning, I, I, early this morning, maybe something got switched out or something. I haven't There's, deleted anything, and no one else has been in the office. I saw this model this morning. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, we're our um, board liaison is out on paternity leave, so. Like uh, usually, he would know exactly what. So we'll have to figure out where it is. JD, right. can you just give it to me real quick? Email it to me. I'll post it. But wh why don't you go ahead, uh, I Mr. Connolly? Apologize for that. No, it's, not, I mean, it's some type of glitch not on your. I'm sorry, I'm not looking at you. And again, I apologize for the confusion. Um, 
So uh, currently what schools are experiencing is a cross-functional group of district staff members in schools supporting and monitoring to ensure that we're ready for school on September 5th and we do have a group of schools that are starting next week as well. However, for this presentation, we are going to talk about that commitment of increasing and improving professional learning opportunities and the things that we've done all summer long with teachers and leaders to ensure that when we return and students return after Labor Day that we have the necessary conditions for teaching and learning. So with that, I will turn it over to my special assistant, Casey Mangle, to go through the rest of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Sean. So what we wanted to do in going through this deck is to kind of categorize the work that we've been doing over the course of the summer in order to provide folks with the kind of development that they need in order to ensure that we ensure that we're ready for academics and instruction when students return. So what we've done through this presentation, you'll see on using these icons, we've identified the school leadership and kind of like leadership team opportunities that we've offered over the summer. Things like the CIO's Institute, our summer leadership series, the Special Education Institute, which we highlighted at the opening of today, and our new principal onboarding work. We'll then take a look at what has been coming out of the Office of Teaching and Learning, specifically the Literacy and Mathematics Institutes, our Gifted and Advanced Learning and English Learners professional development that's occurred over the summer, and the Systemic PD, which is to be occurring um, the following, you know, next week on August 30th. We'll also take a look at professional development that works to um, develop folks as we welcome students back into our building. So things around scheduling, enrollment choice and transfer, our culture and climate academies, um, helping schools ensure that their culture is ready to welcome students, and our Inside Out initiative, which is an athletics initiative. Finally, we'll take a look at um, things that are really specific to certain school models, whether it's the 21st century schools, our priority schools, our SIG-4, the lab school model um, that we presented to the board before, and then our MTSS Academy, which focuses on the 20 CEIS grant schools. So as you may know, we offered the CAO Leadership Institute June 26th to 29th this year. Uh, the institute typically hosts both principals as well as two members of their leadership teams. Average daily attendance there is about 395 to just over 400 folks, ranging from principals, resident principals, assistant principals, uh, and a number of teacher leaders in the district. The focus here was to not only kind of continue the learning that we went through in this past school year with our cycles of professional learning focused on close reading, but to really start to launch into our second cycle, which we'll be um, engaging in throughout the course of the year. And as you'll see, many of our institutes over the course of the summer continued learning in as well. Um, and that cycle is focused on communication, writing, and discourse. Uh, so this really set the stage for that work. Uh, also provided opportunities to engage teachers and principals in differentiated learning opportunities to really help us to more deeply understand the continuum of learners that we're serving here in city schools. Launched at the CIO Institute, uh, we developed something called the Summer Leadership Series uh, for this summer. It spanned four weeks throughout the months of July and August and was a collaborative effort between the Human Capital Office, the Academics Office, our Finance Department, the Chief of Schools, ITD, Communications, OAA. Uh, it really was a cross-functional and collaborative effort in order to offer school leaders, so not just principals, but assistant principals and teacher leaders, the opportunities to engage in um, you know, refresher courses, if these were things that they had already had experience with, or for our new leaders, uh, you know, key learning that they could take and, and run with at their school to start the year. Uh, in the appendix of this, I've provided like the list of courses that are offered per each of those um, departments so that you could really see the overlay of that work. Some of these sessions, although not all, were required. And so we did see this had a really tight overlay with our new principal onboarding. They attended the human capital sessions and they attended our um, suspension services sessions focused on climate uh, and the handbook, uh, you know, student handbook. So uh, these here have received over of 200 registrations across all of our uh, traditional schools. And I think just concluded on August the 9th. 
The Special Education Institute, um, as Chief Connolly highlighted earlier on, just concluded uh, last week and really provided participants with a better understanding of laws, regulations, policies, and procedures that are focused around the development of quality IEPs and the implementation of IEP services for our students to result in better student outcomes. More than 200 attendees participated in the Institute, and we engaged some really key um, stakeholders and community members in coming in and talking about you know, dispro disproportionality and equity really from that special education lens. So we brought back Dr. Lisa Williams. She had come to the CAO's Institute initially to start kicking off some of our whole child work. We saw her again here at the Special Ed Institute uh, with all of these folks up at the Loyola Graduate Conference Center. That allows me to ask a question. Um, while you're, while Fabulous. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I normally wait to the end. Um, so just tell me, how, what's our approach to attendance at a, like, something like a special education institute? Like we, it is so imperative that we get everybody on board across the board and our leadership across the city. And I, I just what's our philosophy behind attendance? So we have a lot of participants. I just don't know, is that every department chair or principals? Is it optional? Why would, why would it be optional? Just love your perspective, Sean. So I, I don't know. Uh, well, we didn't have the space probably to have everyone because we did increase it to administrators, uh, teachers, general ed as well as special ed as well as IEP chairs. And even though I don't like to use the word optional, we didn't capture everybody. But one of the immediate fee pieces of feedback afterwards, like how do we capture like where people are in the space that they're in and what they're thinking and how do we move into the school year and get everyone else. So we even have other IEP chairs such as the lab school IEP chairs which they start school during the IEP chair meetings that happen next week. Um, we'll pull them again. We will pull the new IEP chairs again and again it's just increasing and improving the opportunities and just keep on and the, I, we feel like the better we get the more that they'll want to be a part of this. So that's the philosophy, like you build it, they'll come. Like we, we do exceptional opportunities, but then how, how do we get the people? I just, just how about the people that aren't are you, are, are attending and we're missing people, potentially the ones that are struggling the most? Yeah, so to that point, um, and don't want to completely derail where Casey's going, but there's a concept of like looking at key data points and identifying schools of concern. And even though we have systemic offerings throughout the year, I've pushed my teams, all of my teams, that like, what are you doing outside of the systemic offerings? And if we're identifying schools of concern, those become more mandatory for school, whether it's a secretary, an IEP chair, whoever in the building, whoever's at lead or liaison, to attend those meetings. Gotcha. We're back. <laughs> all right. Um, and even just to piggyback on that, when I think about the summer leadership series, one of the key elements of that, because again, we know summer learning opportunities that are optional don't tend to draw as many people, just generally. However, in working to, dip, to build um, the different courses that were offered during that, we partnered with ILEDs, shared with them the courses, and offices who had grounded the selection of courses they were offering in data were able to say, and here are a couple of schools that you may want to consider to push to attend these. So again, trying to use the data that we have to uh, broaden the conversation and encourage conversations between ILEDs and principals and their leadership teams uh, to encourage participation and attendance in things that we're offering. Okay, so circling back. Um, <laughs> Okay, so we left out the Special Ed Institute. Uh, the other piece uh, for this summer has been new principal onboarding. So we've contracted with BKL, and they are supporting principals in their first through third year, uh, engaging them over the course of the summer in different learning opportunities, in addition to attending uh, the required courses for new principals as part of the Summer Leadership Institute. Um, new principal onboarding specifically was held July 26th uh, to the 29th, and they par participated in activities um, to support schools as they develop school entry plans and uh, really leading the first 90 days of their principalship in their school. So that sort of encapsulates the sessions that we offered specifically targeting school leaders and school leadership. The next few slides take a deeper look at what we offered um, out of the offices of teaching and learning as well as um, the office of human capital to support teachers as we move uh, into 
the coming school year. So the first here highlights um, our work with literacy, specifically our literacy institutes. Uh, I know that the Office of Teaching and Learning is currently reviewing all of their attendance data for these and had approximately 300 um, or so participants in the literacy uh, institute, which continued our work along the cycles of professional learning. As you may know, we have uh, been making the moves toward our new Eureka math curriculum. And so we offered numerous opportunities over the course of the summer to engage teachers and school leaders in diving into the Eureka math work. Uh, through these math institutes, we saw approximately 700 attendees come through and really targeting you know, both general and special educators, um, teachers, math reps, and principals, as well as other school leaders. The Office of Teaching and Learning also offered gifted and advanced learning and English learner opportunities. So the gifted and advanced office offered a three-day, um, offered it on two separate occasions, but a three-day PD series this summer, which supported more than 50 teachers, deepening their knowledge in gifted and advanced learners as part of our uh, continuum of learners here in the district. And our English le uh, learners work engaged roughly 10 different schools, about 30 teachers or so, um, in an institute focused on English learners. Finally, uh, the New Teacher Institute and Mentor Academy, which I won't say too much about here. I'm pretty sure that comes up again later on when we talk about new teacher and new teacher induction. Uh, but we would be remiss if we didn't mention it, as it really is uh, one of the first opportunities that we get to see our new teachers and begin engaging them in content and curriculum. Um, the Office of Teacher Support and Development partnered with uh, the Teaching and Learning Office to ensure that, you know, the Eureka Math Curriculum, again, for example, was getting in front of new teachers, um, as well as other content areas. The New Teacher Institute was offered August 14th to 18th and saw all teachers, new teachers during that time, roughly 220 new teachers attended. And then this week, we have the special educator um, days for those new teachers coming through. So that's happening at present. To support these folks, we offer the Mentor Academy, um, which by and large have concluded, although there's one more left at the end of this week for some of our returning mentors. And these mentors provide specific support to our new teachers as they come into our schools, both in instruction and pedagogy. Finally, and up and coming, we have our systemic professional development on August 30th. It was communicated out to all schools during the CAO Institute and again over the course of the summer that four days, August 29th, 30th, 31st, and September 1st, would be dedicated professional learning days for the district as teachers come back into schools. That said, we reserved August 30th as the day to which we would provide um, district would provide key content development opportunities um, in the areas of literacy, math, uh, social studies, science, GAL, um, English learners, special education, college and career readiness, etc. Uh, these opportunities, and I think unique to the way that we've done it in years past, is that we are offering not only in-person sessions where folks come out to schools, say based on grade level or content area, but we're also offering webinar opportunities so that those who went through institutes over the summer can continue to deepen their learning in teams as other folks go out to schools. So it really allows us to increase our capacity to reach more folks and to differentiate their learning as they come back into the school year. Our next couple of slides are going to look more at um, professional opportunities and work that we've been doing in the academics office to ensure that students are ready and prepared to come back and are coming back into welcoming uh, school and classroom environments. This first slide is really an update on student scheduling support. Our college and career readiness office um, has been working uh, to produce these, uh, this set of data here. What you'll notice and what I want to call out is that we've done a comparison from last year, 16-17, to this year, 17-18, at a time where we're three weeks before the start of school. Uh, right? So it's not necessarily based on a specific date as our school year is starting later this year than it did last, but it is a three-week window prior to the first day of school. So what I want to highlight here uh, is that we've seen a great and dramatic increase over the year prior in terms of our elementary school um, scheduling with more than 80% of those students who have been scheduled into six or more classes. 92.9% um, of our schools, and this is all schools, so it includes charters, this doesn't pull out charters, uh, this is all the schools in the district, 
um, are 92.9% 9, .9 scheduled at this point, or I should say as of last week when we submitted the presentation. Uh, and then in secondary schools, you can see we are roughly on par, a little bit below where we were at the exact same time last year for our secondary schools. We do have some um, August open lab dates, and there are actually a few more than what are listed up here on this slide. They were added to so that we could support additional scheduling, especially at the secondary level. Enrollment Choice and Transfer. Uh, the Office of Enrollment Choice and Transfer offered some refresher courses during that summer leadership series in order to support schools and enrollment officials um, to support families through the registration, enrollment, and transfer process. Uh, I do want to call out on this slide, again, because this was submitted a week back, the uh, transfer window has been extended until August 25th to ensure that we can provide additional supports to families as they seek the appropriate um, alignment with their students in our schools. The Office of Academics is also offering uh, the Culture and Climate Summer Academy. Those happen starting at the end of last week and really go through this week. And what those are are opportunities for our schools who have identified a culture and climate model, say restorative practices, PBIS, or kind of the blended model of those two, uh, to engage in deeper learning with their school teams throughout the course of the summer. Um, so those will conclude at the end of this week. Pardon. And then finally, interscholastic athletics. Just want to call out the Inside Out initiative, uh, which we've been partnering on with the Baltimore Ravens and Under Armour. Uh, this initiative got kicked off just before the CAO Institute on June 21st. We actually also hosted another group during the CAO Institute to ensure that we reached all of our secondary school leaders. Uh, and it's offered the opportunity for both students and coaches to take part in a forum, forum at the Under Armour Performance Center um, in order to uh, engage schools in, in using athletics to kind of deepen culture and climate and student connectivity to schools. The next set of slides focuses more on school models, things that certain types of schools have been doing over the course of the summer to ensure their readiness. So a great example of that is our 21st century uh, learning schools. As you know, we're just about ready to open Frederick and Fort Worthington. Those schools have been engaging in specific and targeted professional development over the course of the summer, focused on project-based learning, STEAM, using technology to engage learners and differentiate instruction. And they're also participating in the restorative practices PD that's being offered at the beginning of this week. For those schools who have been designated as turnaround or priority by MSDE, we've been engaging them throughout the course of the summer, starting at the CAO's Institute uh, and carrying through to a retreat that we hosted in partnership with MSDE August 2nd through the 4th. Uh, the retreat itself really offered the opportunity for those schools to come together, begin writing their plans, and to align their work with City Schools' turnaround strategy. All of their plans are due to MSDE, and they were due to MSDE yesterday. Uh, we've received all the plans and have submitted those, and are excited to begin engaging the schools in the implementation of those plans. Something exciting that we've been doing, not exactly professional development yet, but the type that we're about to get into with these schools, we've engaged the district in, you all are very familiar with our PQS process, and really focused the language in that uh, request for uh, schools, uh, I'm sorry, Just for vendors. clarify P PQS. PQS, pre-qualified services. So it's a procurement process that we have here where we um, put out a, a scope that we are interested in having vendors um, and partners apply to in order to provide services to our schools. So the PQS that we have engaged in is focused on um, providing services specific to turnaround environments, so asking for those vendors to really be able to highlight evidence of effectiveness in turning around low-performing schools through the use of their services. Uh, this is something that we haven't done before. Typically, our turnaround and priority schools, any school, can kind of choose from a bevy of vendors that we've approved through these types of procurement processes before. This one is very specific, asking for evidence of effectiveness um, in turnaround schools. So we're very excited for that process uh, to conclude and to be able to provide these schools with targeted uh, supports and developments uh, as they move forward with their plans. 
Our school improvement grant uh, schools are SIG-4, also known as, right, SIG, school improvement grant, four is cohort four. Uh, we're calling them sort of our, our lab schools, right? This is a cluster of schools uh, that we have been partnering with Mark Martin uh, to develop and support as we move into this school year. They really kicked off their academic PD with their teachers August 14th to 16th uh, in their North Bay retreat, uh, which focused on all staff on the 100% project. This is really a lab school model and really setting up mission, vision, priorities, mindset, team building as they head into the year. Uh, in addition, these schools have been engaging in weekly staff walks in the community, uh, and as you know, they have, they have new leaders, so they're, they're trying to engage folks uh, as they gear up for the school year ahead. Finally, our multi-tiered system of supports academy. This academy supported the 20 CEIS grant schools uh, and really is reflective of another MSDE partnership. Uh, we're working with MSDE. We provided an academy with teaching and learning, special ed, and our whole child office to focus on what we really mean by the MTSS framework in city schools and the implementation of the collaborative problem solving model. So the <laughs> uh, so what we wanted to do there really was just present to you a couple of areas in which we have focused our efforts over the course of the summer. And Sean, I'm going to pass it back to you to wrap up. And, and as I mentioned earlier, um, each year I made commitments to the field. And this past uh, in June at the CAO's Institute, these are the three commitments. Um, one, to uh, make sure or encourage uh, our teachers and leaders to use their voice. We want, we need their feedback. There's no reason for us to continue to do things if they're not experiencing it in a certain way that is going to move, um, move and improve them to move the needle for students. And as I said earlier, increase and improve the professional uh, growth opportunities throughout the district for teachers as well as leaders and utilizing data. I think last year we started um, some really good things around staff processes, especially around special education, and then we started getting into it later in the year with safety and with attendance. And the one area we didn't touch last year, but this year is going to be a focus from the very beginning is an academic stat process as well. And how do we use that information to inform our professional learning opportunities, but also as well uh, as also to um, identify and provide supports to schools. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, questions? Commissioner Berkeley? No, you're good. Commissioner Hightower? Just two quick logistical questions. One, um, the first deck we saw, I'm assuming that's the school readiness, physical readiness. We'll have that tonight. Yes. Is that correct? That's yes. happening yes. at the public yes. forum. Yeah. Okay, yes. perfect. Uh, the other one, on slide 16, you talk about the transfer window. I'm just curious, is that the use of the parents were sort of encouraged to use that window to? to um, take care of transfers, they're not allowed to do that after the 18th or we don't do them after the 18th or what does that mean? It says Ju July 17th yeah. through August 18th. I was just curious what that meant. So I'll let Sean expand on that, but the window itself has been extended through August 26th. So okay. I don't know if you want to talk yeah. more specifically it, about the window. but Originally, it doesn't mean, even when it was the 18th, it doesn't mean that there, we stopped transfers. It's more when it's prior to the 18th, it was parents, you have a choice, where do you want to go? And they work with the enrollment choice and transfer office to, you know, match and make the school fit mm -hmm. for the parents and, and what they're thinking. And we just felt that we should also increase that to make sure that parents and, and students have an opportunity to get to where they feel their student is, their needs are best going to be served. Um, so we just thought it would be better off if we just extended that for another week. And I'm assuming it makes it more difficult to do the transfers after mm -hmm. school has started. That's why you have the sort of... Right window where you're encouraging folks to yeah. sort of access that during yeah. the window is that why we try to get it settled so we it's it's try, we try to get kind of enrollment settled when mm -hmm. students are moving all over the place it's very hard for, to yeah. have school start it's hard to know what to do in terms of staffing human capital has real challenges when they don't exactly know what the numbers are mm -hmm. um, charters and um, schools with wait lists have students on wait lists mm -hmm. and so they're trying to ask you know often um, 
things need to settle a little bit to ascertain who is actually coming to their schools mm -hmm. off the wait list. So there's a, a little bit of a lag. Uh, we're shortening the lag between when traditional schools um, window settles and when the wait list settles. So that's the wait list window is going to um, is going to end a little bit earlier this year. Um, but we're trying to you know what we don't want to happen is that a lot of switching right before September 30th that causes a lot of, um, a lot of challenges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I just remember saying when we used to have it only here, the lines of people, the first week of school, the week prior. How are we getting that information out to people that this is? I mean, maybe that's tonight, and I should just hold that off for tonight's questioning. But or is that? Well, we we working with Ann Fullerton and communications, tweeting, Facebook, things Perfect. like that to mm -hmm. get the word out that we did extend it because um, it was a little last minute, but. Uh, we felt like we just spent the end of last week really trying to plan through it. And I know yesterday I went down to kind of see how we were experiencing it here. And the morning was busy, but by the afternoon it tailed off. Mm -hmm. So we, we have overflow space. We've tried to like address logistics, mm -hmm. and but it, it went fairly smoothly yesterday. And to the po question earlier, um, when parents come into transfer, they do have, after a decision or we make um, a match, they do have a certain amount of time to go and process the paperwork out of school or mm -hmm. so because we do want it to get settled by the first day of school. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my last question is just to follow up to your question earlier about um, the PD and who accesses it and I, I said there's a lot of teacher based PD here and they're not employed or well, they're employed but they're not <laughs> required to work over the summer months so how do we encourage yeah. teachers you talked about school leaders and I'm just curious how you encourage the teachers. Yeah. To come back, do we, do we pay them? Do we? How do we get them? To well, school? I think two things. I think, like I said earlier, I think if, as we get better at it and they have more positive experiences and they, they have it. voice, they'll want it. But we also do. Um, we provide stipends as well for teachers mm -hmm. to participate. Yep. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay, I have a, I have a couple questions, and then I have a big big picture question. But first, uh, slide fifteen. Um, so. I guess uh, three weeks prior to the, our high schools, we have 56% of our schedules done. What's, uh, can we just state that the expectation is 100% done by the first day of school? Or when is the, what, when is the expectation that 100% of schedules will be done? Well, I would say the expectation for 100% schedule was, has already passed. Um, mm -hmm. we, we've been communicating from the very beginning. We get a daily report on this. We've been working with the yeah. chief of schools and the ILEDs. Uh, personal letters to principals. We opened up the labs even more. Um, we are working one on one with schools okay. now to get this done. Okay. And we've been and doing what's that the for what's the reason weeks. why a schedule wouldn't be done at this point? I think there's. For this um, last year. I think some of it could be just the movement of children still at this point in time. Mm -hmm. um, I think that some schools, I mean, every school is different. Some schools, the person who is doing their master scheduling is no longer with the school. So the pr new principles, like just getting people up to speed on current systems. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, is this something you could update us on prior to the first day of school? Like, uh, Absolutely. And maybe, AJ, that could be a, something that we so, could document. You could update, you could update the board on. On the BEO updates or the end of the week updates. Hi, Danny Hiller, manager. Of uh, uh, the, just uh, update on the school by school scheduling to make sure that we have 100 percent before percentage of secondary schools completed schedules. Do you have an updated number? Is that okay? Danny Hiller, manager of College and Career Readiness. Um, right now, as of yesterday, we had um, 26 schools at that 90 percent or more mark. There's 13 schools in the um, 70 to 90 range, and of that 13, what, what does that mean? 70 to 90 range. 13, 70. So we so, typically look for um, schools with students scheduled in six or more classes for the school for the school year. Um, so in that set, so we're looking for 100 percent of students scheduled in six or more classes. Yes. Or um, and to be considered ready, you need 90% of your students scheduled in six or more classes. So of the 13 schools in the 70 to 90 range, and there's some back feed here, I'm sorry, um, 10 of those 13 are at 87% or more. But that would still get, let's say we get all 13 of those, 26 but 13 is, so is that, 39, and then there's still five schools that are below 70%. Cor correct. 70% of students that have six or more. Six, six, or more, six or more classes, yeah. and some of that. So one of those, for example, is an AO, is one of our AOP schools. 
they have all their students scheduled for the first trimester of classes, mm -hmm. and they've indicated to us that they do that they typically do a trimester to trimester based um, scheduling approach due to um, the fact that the students are are over credited or over aged and under credited, and um, the need and the the needs of their students change pretty quickly. There's another one. There's another school that actually had less than um, less than six classes for their year-long scheduling mm -hmm. model, and so we're working with them to figure out. So they said, "Hey, we're we're yeah. completely scheduled. We filled out our filled out our model. So we're working with them to figure out why." why there's that particular circumstance. Yeah. So there's some unique yeah, there's circumstances. Yeah, there's unique circumstances. Yeah, if you could just give us a weekly update this week and the, before the next week uh, that of the percentages, uh, six or more for secondary schools, yeah. I'd be really We will absolutely get a, okay. a memo to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Sorry, you want, to, you want this on the Friday updates? Friday, Friday oh, and next Friday? It would be great, yeah. Um, so my other question was just – I'm, I just want to give a huge shout out um, the SIG4 lab schools. This, what's going on there I just think is very innovative where we have leaders who, who are committed to turning around our schools that are coming together and led by an active practitioner and Mark Martin. And I just think it's a great, great model. And I just I thank you guys for the update. I know there's a ton of work to pull this off before the beginning of this school year. And that we're, we're not just we're not we're really diving in with a new strategy to try to give a great education um, to the schools that deserve it. So just please, I just want to encourage you to give us updates on this because this is something I think the board is really interested in. And I know you guys are really putting a lot of energy in it could be something that we kind of learn from this is a kind of a great model that we could expand and we will absolutely give you updates and we're excited as well but I'm also wondering like what else can this lead to like mm -hmm. when you talk about innovative approaches and I've had other principals reach out with other ideas now and before yeah. they may have just tried to stick to their own little schoolhouse and there we have really good principals thinking beyond that right now it's awesome it's awesome. Thank you. Um, so then my big picture question is and in reading the procurement items uh, like which we're going to get to later, and then just hearing all the activity, you know, um, how are we tracking what's working? Like, what's our evidence of effectiveness of all this activity? And I know that we do surveys of teacher participation. Every teacher says that it's incredibly valuable and it's been really meaningful. And I know that's, a, I know attendance and, and, and participant feedback is one level of indication. Um, I worry that we're just doing a lot of activity and it's kind of scattershot. And how, are, and my, all I, uh, it could be that way. I just want us to be asking the questions of what's working and how do we know and what's our evidence of effectiveness. So, I, I, and, and I'm not saying, like, so what, what measures have you in place and what are you thinking about to track our effectiveness of PD? Um, that, those, are, those are my questions. Well, I think those are incredible questions, and I think those are the things that we're working through right now. Like, even with the three-year academic goal, like, what are those measures that are going to say that we are moving towards them? Or even with the blueprint that will come out later, like, what are those measures? Like, we're in conversations now, because there is an element of, like, you know, the result indicators and that qualitative data, and are we, a change, are we changing adult practice, which is really important, because if you change adult practices, then you think the student outcomes are going to change as well. But I think we're still in the process of identifying, like, what are those measures that we're going to almost like live by. And I think the academic stat, that, that's the purpose of that. Right. And then, and, and this is a conversation going on nationally. And so I don't know if there's a space at some of our meetings. Maybe I'll, I'll speak with AJ and you, um, Mr. Conley, around putting it in. Like, what are best practices of, of um, leading indicators that were changing adult practice, yeah. right? Beyond, again, showing up and taking feedback, getting feedback from teachers, and ultimately academic outcomes. That's what we want. Yeah. But then what, are there ways that we can track teachers who have been in, who are going consistently? Like we're, we're rolling out Eureka Math. We're bringing in ANET, and we're going to pay a contractor a good amount of money for formative assessment and professional development. I just want to know, is it working? Are teachers implementing the practices? Is it resulting in activity that we believe in and it's going to lead to outcomes and if it's not that's good too so we stop doing it 
I worry that we layer on things yeah. and we keep layering on things and we don't know if it's actually effective. Yeah. So what I want to know is as we're making, because we're making some big investments coming up, and I'm okay with that, with the instructional materials and, and uh, like the ANET contract that's coming up. Um, and I think it's the right thing to do, but I just want to be able to step back and say, Either or, yeah. is it working? Yeah. And so, so it's, it's not ultimately, it's like, what are the interim measures that we can be putting in place of what, it, seeing if, if things are on track to be working? I completely agree. And I think the stu identifying what student outcomes measures, but I also think like that cycle of improvement, like how does the chief academic office, how does teaching and learning, college and career readiness and special education, how do we work with the ILEDs and the chief of schools in like our own learning walk so we have our own visual to see our, we know what professional learning opportunities that we're providing for schools, are we actually seeing that in schools and then are we seeing it in the student outcomes? So I think it's, I think it's a combination of those outcomes as well as the result indicators. And uh, yeah, so and I, and I, that, that, that I, I, there's no big, there's no answer here. This is like, this is a big thing the field is, always, has always struggled with. What's effective PD and how are we measuring it and how do we know? And um, it would be great to think about like, a presentation around that like the idea like a brainstorming like what, what's happening what, what's happening um, nationally what can we learn from uh, what are I just I just want us to be informed and again encourage us to set those things in place so we could two years from now say you know we wanted this to change adult practice um, this is what we were going for and it hasn't, we haven't seen it. So we're not recommending this program anymore. Or we've actually made huge strides and it's resulting in it, like early indications that it's actually knocking it out of the park and we should triple down on it. Um, I, just, I just want us to try to be as disciplined as possible on the evaluation effectiveness piece because um, it's, it's gonna be really, really important. So that's my last comment. Okay. Thank you, Casey. Thank you. Good morning again. I'm Sean Conley, the Chief Academic Officer. Good morning, Heather Nolan, Director of Knowledge Management, Office of Achievement and Accountability. Good morning, Rachel Haynes, uh, Ed Specialist for Assessment and SLO in Mr. Conley's office. Good morning, Janice Lane, Executive Director of Teaching and Learning. And we're a little bit behind schedule, so I, I'm gonna push through just a couple of slides really quick here. Um, Want to go? Yeah, no, it would be great to if we had 15, 20 minutes. So um, go one more then. Go that would be great because yeah. we've got a bunch of <laughs> we've got a bunch of procurement <laughs> items, and Commissioner High Cupboard and I have an eleven o'clock meeting, yeah. so we actually have a hard stop. Okay, so I'll turn it over in like ten seconds. So sure. um, at the <laughs> I'm just try to roll really quick to get into the meat of it. Um, so at the CO Institute, one of the things we identified and acknowledged was all the different things that good schools do and all the things that we require of schools. And one of the things that we've been talking about probably for like the past six to eight months has been assessment and data literacy. You know, um, the, is it the right assessment? Are we using it the right way? Or how are teachers and students experiencing it? Um, just wanting to get the most out of it to make sure that it, you know, influence practices as well as uh, meets, uh, helps identify the needs for students and aligns resources to that. So um, assessment strategy uh, has been a huge conversation internally and externally. And I can add the five second version for the next two slides. You've seen the academic goal that we've been focused on and really um, developing our coherency model around. So again, in doing part of what you just highlighted, Commissioner Canham, was the idea of how do we know if we're progressing towards this goal. So the next slide really highlights the work that we focused on last year. 
um, focusing on what is the task, what is the work, how do we know our students. So this idea of how do we continue to monitor, measure, and modify instruction on a daily basis, which brought about the need for additional assessment and really revisiting our assessment strategy as a whole. So that is what you'll see in the upcoming slides. Okay, I'm going to go pretty quickly through a couple of background type slides here. This framework really buckets out the different types of assessments that we see and we utilize throughout the school year. At the top, um, we have more standardized um, large scale forms of assessment in both um, interim and common formatives, and then readiness and achievement-based assessments. Down at the bottom of this framework, we see smaller scale assessments. Um, on the formative side, we have classroom level, and on the summative side, we have some grading type assessments. Um, when we talk about these assessments, we're going to refer to the data that they provide us as um, leading when we talk about formative assessment for instruction and lagging, which are really our summative measures. Um, I think we can skip through these, those couple. Uh, when we take the definitions off and, and take a look at the actual assessments that we have in our suite here in the district, um, you might notice that MSDE requirements really cluster all in that readiness and achievement-based quadrant there. Um, and then when we take a look at what district requirements represent, you can see that we're trying to balance and create a well-rounded approach to this assessment strategy by filling out interim and common, common formative assessments. And additionally, we get into grading at the high school levels in 9 through 12 down with the middle of course and, and excuse me, end of course assessments. To get a little deeper into the formative assessment bucket that we um, that we have there, you can see that some of the questions we ask ourselves as we assess students, where are we now, where are we going, and how do we close the gap, those really mirror the elements of the instructional core, um, knowing our students, knowing content, and knowing pedagogy. Um, in, the, in the next little bit, we're going to actually highlight two of those interim and common formative assessments, the curriculum embedded writing that is noted here, and interims for math. Curriculum embedded writing tasks are actually something that are new to our assessment strategy, at least in the time that I've been working with it. Um, and the reason that we brought that forward is in service of that three-year academic goal that we've discussed several times um, over the course of this session today. So in grades K through 5, that could be explorations in nonfiction writing tasks or responses to reading. In grades 6 through 12, the literacy design collaborative tasks, or the LDCs, um, are a part of the daily work that students do. So they don't actually perceive these to be additional assessments. But through um, the cycles of professional learning and some focus on looking at student work protocols, we'll actually be um, creating a more normative approach to understanding where our students are based on these writing tasks. Um, just another look at the cycles of professional learning we've referenced frequently. Um, last year starting off with gathering information from complex grade level texts um, through uh, close reading and supportive devices like text dependent questioning. This year on this bridge you can see that we're taking that information and using oral and written academic discourse to turn that into knowledge. On the interim assessment end, we recognize through feedback collected from our teachers, our school leaders, as well as our district office staff, that there is a need for data that helps, un helps us understand whether students are performing and accessing our standards-based curriculum. And as such, what we're going to present is our proposal for our interim assessment uh, implementation uh, for the next two years, but where we really see the use of interim assessments, it supports teachers 
in their uh, information that they're gathering around their, their pacing as well as the supports that they're offering students. At the school leader level, this data really supports their, collect, their collective learning, the collaborative planning that they implement at the school level as well as their professional development. And then at the district office level, it'll support our own data cycle review work as well as the professional development that we're providing at the, the school level. So in thinking about that um, and in uh, factoring in this well-rounded approach around what can teachers take on in addition to the new curriculum that they're taking on specific to math, uh, we are proposing that in fall 2017, we develop and implement a math interim assessment uh, framework. Uh, and in addition to that, we have our curriculum embedded writing tasks that are highlighted as part of the cycles of professional learning, which Rachel just uh, went through in, in previous slides. In the second semester of school year 17-18, once we complete our audit of our ELA curriculum, then we'll evaluate what is the best option for us for an interim assessment that is aligned to standards-based curriculum that gives data at that standard level for teachers to use. And then in school year 18-19 is when then we would adopt and implement an ELA interim assessment. So it's really thinking about this as a slow release model, factoring in the focus of this year being on, L on the writing component for students, but then also on an interim assessment that is aligned to the uh, math, the new math curriculum that's being implemented this year. Again, as I was mentioning, uh, and, in, and as we've discussed, there's a new math curriculum, uh, Eureka Math. Uh, it was brought to the board in June, and there's been a lot of great work over the summer to get teachers ready in this, and there will be a lot of support offered to teachers and school leaders around the use of Eureka Math. And what we want to do is couple the curriculum with a strong interim assessment uh, that will help gauge students' mastery of learning as well as inform teachers' pacing. So what we, pref uh, what we are recommending is that we have an assessment that is aligned to that standards-based curriculum. Uh, that it is Eureka aligned, but that it is also offering a lot of park rigor, so it gives them that experience of taking a park-like assessment. Uh, the frequency would be four times a year. It would be uh, covered during a 45 to 60 minute block of a student's time in, in a classroom. There would be the option of an online uh, online assessment and park-like test items, and that the reporting would be able to drill down to the student level, but offer a lot of informative information, not just at the student level, but classroom, school, and then more at a district-wide performance. Uh, we also are recommending for a later implementation our checkpoints. So these are the assessments that would be done more quickly during the classroom so that teachers could gauge very early on whether the students are mastering uh, based on topic progression. And this option would be paper and online. Uh, and also, again, going back to that park-like test type item so that students are becoming more familiar and accustomed to what they should see at that summative assessment point. So moving forward and what we'll discuss, I'm sure, at, uh, th during this teaching and learning committee uh, a little bit later on is the procurement of a standard-based align interim assessment for math. Uh, with the inclusion of a library of optional uh, checkpoints that would be available at the elementary and high school grade levels. Um, during all of this conversation around assessments, we wanted to keep uh, forefront in our minds the way that students would experience assessments across the board. And so we have a couple of samples here of what our students will see plan for this year. Um, we have a second grade sample here and what you'll notice is that with Reading 3D and iReady, the curriculum embedded writing task and the math, math interims, we have all leading data points coming in around these students as they are in younger grades and progressing rapidly. We want to make sure that even though there's no MSDE summative requirement, we do have a handle on how those students are growing. 
when we take a look at a slightly higher grade level here, sixth grade, you'll notice that we still have some of those leading data points coming in, um, iReady, math interims, and the curriculum embedded writing, and then we also have this additional layer around PARC here. One of the things I didn't note on the previous slide is at the very bottom we have a note about the hours of assessment and um, that, as you can see in sixth grade, we have 18.5 hours estimated for students this year and that's 1.7% of their instructional hours overall. Finally, uh, we wanted to take a view of a high school level. This is a ninth grade view. Um, the same three formative or leading data points are noted at the top here, and we have park carrying through as well. In high school, as we mentioned before, we add in some grading, um, kind of grading style assessments with end of course and middle of course assessments there. The, the last kind of assessment item specific that we wanted to um, touch base on here was iReady. In the third year of implementation, um, we were considering some of the things that we were adding in, such as those math interims, and really reflected on the dosage that would be recommended for students to balance out um, our approach with the formative assessments here. As you can see, in elementary and middle school at the top, we're at we're recommending that students, all students, complete the first and the third window, so a window of assessment in September and one again in March. Um, and then in high school, all students are assessed at window one. On the recommended side here, we'll be supporting and working with schools to make strategic decisions around which students may be assessed at the second and third window, just depending on grade level there. Um, various reasons could influence that decision. Um, just one example might be a group of students that are being um, that are experiencing a given intervention and you want to make sure that that intervention is effective throughout the year and really moving them accordingly. So, so I'm going to jump in here because I, I know we only have five minutes. My, my question is, um, I ready. I ready does math. So now we're doing Eureka math and we're doing four interim assessments on Eureka math. Mm -hmm. So are we going to stop the I ready math um, on grades? Is there, is there, because uh, the I ready are formative assessments mm -hmm. um, or interim assessments. Uh, to tell me how the, the overlap. one that measures growth, whereas the the interim assessment that we're proposing for math is one that measures mastery of a standard. So the way that the iReady is set up as an assessment to what an interim is set up, they're very different types of assessments. The iReady and the strength of the iReady is that one, it can gauge growth from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. In addition, it can let us know at the beginning of the year where a student is placing. So where is that grade level placement for that student because of the adaptive nature of that assessment. And because of that ad adaptive nature of the assessment, it doesn't do a one-to-one -one alignment to standards. So for, a, for example, a grade four student is assessed and based on whether they're understanding and getting that assessment or the item type uh, for grade level four, it'll keep testing them with harder items to determine whether they are receiving uh, or understanding uh, content that are above grade level four to then place them at, let's say, a grade level five. Similarly, if the student at grade level four is not doing well on that assessment, they'll give them easier ass uh, assessment items to then place them at a lower level. So that's where it's, it's complex in that iReady, while a good gauge of placement level and growth throughout the year doesn't give that standard level data that a teacher and a school leader needs. Uh, I, I have to say, I, I I'm, as a per person who's been in education for a while, that was hard to follow. And what I'm hearing consists, I mean, we're doing park because we got to know how our schools are doing and our kids are sitting through it. And I, I, I like the overall number of hours overall. I am all about formative and interim assessments so kids are learning and growing. And so then we instituted iReady for that purpose. And now if we're layering on another set of interims for mastery, um, it, it does seem a lot, I mean, this is the number one complaint I get from families and parents, and I'm 
I'm just concerned. I, I would autom- – I mean, I, I, we've got to try it again about, like, why do we now have – I ready four times a year, I ready – or three times, three times a year. And now we're going to have four math interim assessments that every kid's going to sit through? Or, part or of two? that – part of the recommendation here is to attempt to balance some of that. So then – in the elementary and middle school grades, you would have two times a year for iReady at the beginning and at the end with that um, strategic selection of students that you might want to follow throughout the rest of the year. But we will release that decision-making power to the schools so that they can they can think about exactly who it is that they would like to follow that, that number of times. And then in high schools, the only requirement for the iReady assessment would be at the very beginning of the year to get a baseline on where they are. And again, they can go through the thought process of selecting the students that would uh, that would be followed through the second and third administrations. An overarching feedback that we heard from teachers around particularly math was being able to drill down to the standard level, which I already was not giving them that information that they could use directly in their teaching in a weekly manner. So this was a, in response to also making sure that the data that the assessments are providing are actionable that teachers can utilize to in, ensure instruction is more appropriate for all students. So I think the only thing I would add to that, and again, it just sort of speaks to this broader challenge, because this isn't just a local challenge, this is a national challenge around really understanding what's the role of assessment and how do you balance the needs of what needs to happen in the classroom, as well as understanding sort of where kids are in relation to those college career readiness standards. This actually fits in line with an overarching strategy that does cover both pillars, and that has been sort of the best practice. And so I know a few years back when we came forward to procure iReady, that was a choice that we were going to move forward with the growth aligned assessment first versus doing the curriculum aligned and doing a growth assessment simultaneously. To some extent, this sort of brings us back to that broader strategy, but provides that level of flexibility to address some of the challenges that are very real and that we want to be responsive to. So I think for what it's worth, I think the team collectively has really tried to listen to the field and think through ways that we can both partner and empower schools, but also give them the real tools that they're asking for. And that's really one of the key benefits of having the curriculum aligned assessments along with iReady. It sort of completes the toolkit, if you will, to being able to support them more comprehensively. And I think the good news is with some of the advances around some of these assessments, even with these changes, we're still staying within those Got that guidance around testing times, being mindful around what the testing experience is for kids. So we do have, while you have some examples here of what that means as the percentage of instructional hours, those details are available for every single grade. So that is publicly available. And we're pretty much within line for the vast majority of the grades. Well, what we see what's happening. So, so I am all about getting good information to give teachers in their hands to actually improve for students. Um, I have to say my sixth grader was exhausted by the level of assessment that he had to go through last year. Um, and um, and I, I just want us to be super critical about how many, how much of that we're, we're, we're doing. I get, I get that we're underneath the 2%, but what we find what's happening is that's not including what teachers are in, in, doing as well. Their tests, that they're in, which you, you want to know. You want to do from exit tickets to actually tests, unit tests, and things of that nature. And I just... Um, I just have to say that I'm concerned. I mean, um, that we, I know we have to do the balance. That was very helpful, Dr. Jones, that we're completing the cycle of growth and standards and curriculum aligned along with summatives. Um, but I, I just want us to be super, super critical and want to know how we're, how we're helping teachers and schools think about then how are we doing the uh, other assessments that, that each teacher is going to do. Um, but. Yeah, I just want to be very simple breakdown. So we did iReady last year. Was it four times? Right, three. Three. Mm -hmm. Right. So now we're doing it, reducing it to two, and we're adding and it one two. For high and uh, and well, one for high school. Yeah, and then for the new assessment, it's two. So we're just adding one additional assessment for elementary school age. No, it's, with the interims, it's four times four a year. Times. Okay. Okay. For for for, 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 for the math. For math. For math. And then iReady's how many? Two. It's two with a possible third. So, and that's, that's the key on this slide here. What we were trying to do is to break down that there are differences in what's being recommended for the elementary middle grades versus high schools, mm -hmm. as well as for the MTSS question, which is really around you know, looking at a universal screener for intervention. 
And so, and that's one of the things that we have found and have learned is that there is a lot of benefit of being able to use a diagnostic like iReady to figure out how far below is a student to actually inform those intervention strategies. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons we wanted to definitely keep having that, that first window in there across the board and actually consider using it for the universal screener. I, I hear you. I'm not trying to debate this. I, at the same time, you know, use your, your child as an example. I will use mine as well. The the iReady says he's at a certain place in math, but his teacher doesn't understand how to take him to the next level. To your point, um, Janice, that the standards-based approach is really necessary for a classroom teacher to really understand how to move a child. So my child's iReady growth on the map was like this because no one could understand how to get him from already being advanced to the next level. And I just, it was a concern that I think all kids would then have, whether it be behind, advanced, or whatever, is understanding what's that next standard to help teachers understand how to teach it, especially given the elementary math. It's something we struggle with in general because folks aren't comfortable teaching math. So I just, I understand what you're saying, Mr. Kendall. I just, I just think we could get a report back on sort of how schools are experiencing this and what it looks like. But I, I just, at some point, it's necessary to really understand what you're teaching. And I think at the middle school level, you sort of, you're more, you understand more where kids are. And I think at the elementary level, we really are, are kind of shooting in the dark about what we're actually supposed to be teaching. So I really do appreciate this thoughtfulness about sort of standards-based approach as addition to growth. No, I, I appreciate that perspective, and I'd love to debate it more because <laughs> actually, I actually think it's it's actually what we hear out in the field. And the the the, the um, can, can we just so I, I totally appreciate your comment. I want to recognize the completion of curriculum aligned standards assessments that help us teach. But I also know that schools are also doing NWA maps as well. Uh, schools can choose that, right? Um, I, uh, schools would they, they, generally. We have some charter schools. I charters do that, it, but is it? You, we're not. Okay, all right. Um, okay, that those are my my, my questions. Um, I just the, again, what the the data and research says when they we scan across the country is yes, we're less than two percent, and this is that's, that that that's. But if we're layering on more and more at the district and school level, it gets too much for our kids. And I just want us to be really diligent on why we're doing it and how we're doing it and the amount of time. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, OK. Um, just to follow up on what Teresa was saying about the use of iReady in those, um, there are actually nine identified MTSS pilot schools that have academic, um, academic identification criteria. And this will be used in those schools to, to go through three times a year and identify the levels of risk and then um, group students for the three layers of instruction, so universal tier or strategic tier and then intensive tier there. So that's kind of just to close the loop on why we have that there for those MTSS schools this year. And then this slide, More Learning, Less Testing Act, um, we sort of touched on this a little bit as we've talked about the instructional time and the hours. But I did just want to remind everyone that this sort of recaps what the key steps are in terms of the implementation of this new law. Um, we've been making really good steady progress towards these implementation milestones. The first step was actually meeting with the BTU and actually talking about where we are in terms of assessments. You'll notice that there are specific requirements that will actually lead to what will be a district committee on assessments. So sort of going back, Commissioner Cannon, to your point around how do we continue to learn about this? How do we continue to make sure that this is working the way that we've intended? And how do we make adjustments along the way? That's really the purpose of this so that there is a stakeholder involvement in that overarching process. So without going through each of the bullets, the key takeaways here is that we are on track for implementing in accordance with this law. Um, we will be coming back with recommendations to speak to what the assessment plan for next year looks like um, in December. So it'll be much earlier um, than what we've been in the past. And then there will be an ongoing process that sort of has an on off year cycle to it in terms of working through what's the rubric that we're going to be using to determine which assessments we use and how. How do we avoid duplicative, duplicativeness of assessments? And how are we then mindful around what the actual impact is on instructional time? So 
the references in terms of the 2%, I do just want to point out that those are sort of the defaults that the state requires you to move forward with if, in fact, you don't come to some agreement that would allow for a larger percentage of time to be dedicated. So again, it just sort of speaks to districts still have flexibility to do what they think is in the best interest of their staff and students, but there is a sensitivity that gets you right around that 2% threshold, um, and we're very mindful of that. Great. So I'm going to ask you all to have concluding comments as we have 13 minutes for the procurement agenda. Absolutely. So the last slide just brings together that point of really trying to have coherency and connection into practice. I think the last point Commissioner High Hubbard brought up around what do you do with the data once you have it, that that's our goal around this curriculum implementation. So we all understand the complexity of teaching. Um, as well as being responsive to the data. So the work that we will continue to ground in is around our collective learning. What are we doing with those formative assessments that we have? Most importantly with teachers, how do we unpack that data and look at the curriculum implementation around that? So what comes next for students who are struggling, accelerating, on grade level, et cetera? Um, and we'll be continuing that work in CLN meetings when we work with our community learning networks, our clusters of schools, as well as when we pull our math and literacy representatives that we work with monthly to go back and work with teachers during collaborative planning, and during those opportunities when teachers look at the data and think about implications for students. And then finally in our systemic professional development, um, as you heard, especially in math, they've been spending quite a bit of time over the summer looking at this connection, but also then we'll be continuing that work across the year. So again, being mindful of the comments that you shared and con con continuing in that complexity through the coherence of what we're trying to touch people with. Awesome. Any concluding comments? Just Wonderful. I just appreciate the thoughtfulness behind this. I know that we struggle with this on a regular basis, but I just, this is such smart work, and I just appreciate that we've, we've been moving in this direction, so it's great to see. And happy birthday, Janice. Oh, thank you. Oh. And it's Rachel's birthday, too. We're both oh. together to share happy assessment. Happy birthday to both of you. That's right. Right. Me. Birthday's Absolutely. right before the beginning of school year. Like, a <laughs> right. happy birthday. Thank you. Wonderful. So let's uh, move to, uh, to procurement. Um, Ed first. Uh, I guess just initial, it's, um, it's, it's a, a, the chief of staff uh, request for $140,000 for a report around current. Um, can you just um, kind of share just uh, general uh, rationale for the need of this report and why it's um, on expedited timeline? Yes. So um, we, um, you know, we've been, as you know, working on our development of our blueprint, which we are rolling out uh, this week. We met with elected officials yesterday, and then in the CEOs Institute this week, it will be the large focus of, of that work. Um, we've been doing the work of developing the blueprint for some time, looking at international research um, as well as best practice um, in, in Baltimore as, and research around the country in terms of what we should be doing, how we should be changing our practice to really focus the resources, um, strategically use the resources we have um, to move the needle on instruction. Um, we've had the opportunity of having a lot of um, uh, chances to have really good conversations with um, with Dr. Um, Kerwin uh, as he's doing his work as part of the Kerwin Commission. And at the same time that we were doing our work, the Kerwin Commission was also looking at some of the very same research on international best practice. They had uh, Dr. Santelisis come to uh, testify at one of the commission meetings to talk about our um, teacher contracts um, and, our, and our principal contracts and how uh, they were held up as one of the only two places in the country that has contracts that would actually support the kind of professional learning communities that are identified uh, by research as kind of the difference between those countries that outperform uh, the United States and, um, and, uh, and the United States. And so we're, um, so they were very interested. She, you know, is typical of Dr. Santelisis, gave very clear um, uh, information about the benefits of those contracts as well as the, very frankly, the ways in which we have not fully implemented them. So one of the goals of the blueprint is to really more fully implement those, um, those contracts. Um, in a follow-up conversation with um, 
Dr. Kerwin, he talked about what we would do that under the Thornton formula that additional resources were provided to LEAs, but LEAs uh, were not required to do anything differently with these additional resources. And one of their concerns being that if additional resources were provided under a new adequacy formula, what would we do with those resources and how would they hold us accountable for it? And uh, we said in that conversation that we think they should ask us for a plan, a plan of specifically what we would do if we had additional resources. So so, um, so he thought that was a great idea, and so we are going forward to develop that plan. So um, the blueprint really lays out, again, using the limited resources we have, and by state state measures, we are significantly underfunded in terms of the resources we, we are receiving. We are trying to strategically use the resources we have as well as possible. But what this, new, the, what this plan would do is take the blueprint and really fully um, – uh, um, extend it to if we could really provide that low level of education to all of our students, if we could provide the kind of staffing um, that you would need in order to um, and schedules that you would need in order to create professional learning communities where teachers are um, getting professional learning in school, in their school time, they're not in front of, te of students all the time, where their um, senior, more experienced teachers are mentoring less experienced teachers, um, and where teachers are developing their content knowledge, what that would really look like and what the cost would be, um, and, uh, and providing that to the commission. Um, our goal is to get that to them in October. As you may know, their work ends in December, and so we're trying to really provide that information in a timely way to the commission so that as they're finishing their work looking at the, at the best practice like we have, and they start turning to the work of what it would cost to actually fund that, that we can help fill a little bit of the gap between those two things to help show what it would actually look like to fund schools that way and what, school, what we would do with those resources. Um, and so that's the reason for the urgency around it is that we're trying to get it in before um, the Kerwin work finishes and then it could also be a tool that our um, our partners um, that as we're advocating for additional resources under Kerwin they can really point specifically to what it is that we would do with these additional resources as opposed to just advocating for the additional resources but more specifically what it would look like in classrooms that was very helpful any other questions okay. thank you Um, the next one. Um, oh, hello. <laughs> are, are, are you uh, are you going to help us with the procurement request? Okay, wonderful. You introduce yourself, please. Yes, Sorry, sir. I didn't I'm, see you. I'm Joe Vogel, procurement. Manager. Hi, Joe. Nice to see you. Um, so the second item uh, around um, uh, the request for the board approval for competitively bid contracts for the library professional development for librarians. Um, any questions on that? Okay, let's go to the next one, uh, IB, um, Commissioner High Cupboard. Yeah, just one quick question on enrollment. I'm looking at the chart where it shows the numbers of students enrolled per program per school, and I'm just curious, are these the total school populations at each of these schools, or are they um, a, a fraction of the kids? It looks like a pretty hefty, hefty enrollment, so I'm just curious because it doesn't give school population side uh, next to that, so I'm just curious. Hi, Lara O'Hanian, Director of Differentiated Learning. Um, I'll double check for you, but I believe that's the whole school population, so I'll send a follow-up if there's anything different. Yeah, just fantastic. I mean, yeah. I, I like that approach. I was just wanting to confirm that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all I can. And this comes from school budgets to pay for this? Okay. Part of it? What's the, what's the breakdown again? I read this, so I just want to make sure. Yes. No. 300 well, it says it says funding source so individual school budgets but then and but we we yeah, we, we, provide that. we we pay a portion right. so for BIA yes they provide they pay for that on their own because that's a charter mm -hmm. um, and if I'm not mistaken and I'm not the expert yeah. on this if I'm not mistaken there is an IB supplement that's provided mm -hmm. um, I believe that was part of the larger yep. budget mm -hmm. and that goes to support this specific initiative the reason why I ask is because I have actually been just thrilled by our growth of IB and I'm seeing the learning firsthand and I want to think about how we expand IB offerings and what it costs, like what it literally costs because to me this is a very small number and uh, uh, for the outcome that we're getting and so I want to think about that. So I don't have any further questions. Great. Thank you.
Um, it's a hodgepodge contract. I know. This one, <laughs> this is the hodgepodge contract that I, like, but the instructional materials that people, this is the level learning libraries. Do you want to just talk us through, Janice, about um, who can choose these? Uh, Sure. And why? Absolutely. Janice Lane, Executive Director of Teaching and Learning. This is basically, as you said, kind of our catch-all opportunity. Mm -hmm. So these are contracts um, and the opportunity to extend either vendors that we've been using over the past couple of years, three years, in renewing. These have been reviewed for alignment of curriculum as well as alignment of need from schools. So what we do is work with procurement and look at previous spending to determine the cost estimates uh, and basically understand that schools can choose to purchase these services based on, again, alignment to curriculum and need. Um, and in most schools, these are existing resources, so they're also a replenishment opportunity. So for leveled libraries, it's not necessarily replacing an entire library, but it may be a grade level or um, certain levels that they're supplementing and adding to. So, so my question is, how do we know it's these are working? There's so many they can choose from. People choose from them. What is our period of review? And when I look at this next year, is it going to be different? And how do we know? Right. So again, basically what we do is they submit um, a proposal for us. And part of the proposal does have an effectiveness measure in that, as well as us meeting with the schools that currently partner with them. But is it effectiveness of using with our students? It depends on how long it's been in yeah. existence with the program. So certain things like using the small group leveled text, we look at, at their TRC scores, for example, and look at are the text matching that and getting results from teachers and feedback around is it something that aligns to our curriculum, works with our curriculum, et cetera. Each of these vendors typically partner with the office as well that they're working with. So for example, when you look at um, American Reading, looking at leveled text, they meet with the content team in literacy often to know what the curriculum is. We'll review their materials before they're actually making recommendations. And so it's an ongoing partnership in that as well. So same with Spire, when you look at that, that's actually in the special education office. So we look at students doing that through our learning walks, partnering in the chief of schools when we're doing learning walks in buildings and monitoring where students are performing. So one um, suggestion would be when we come back next year and we're doing the same piece of it, is that we have an appendix that we actually show the evidence of effectiveness, because it says that you, you're doing your due diligence with our students, um, like that it's working within our schools if we're extending contracts like this, because it's hard to kind of judge whether these are how effective they are. Um, and, and it'd also be great to know which ones we're discontinuing, because we don't feel like it's getting what the results that we want. Absolutely. Um, that's all the questions I have. Um, Pathology, um, 10.04. Any questions? My only question is just gonna is gonna uh, just again. It's the vendor. It's the vendor reviews that we that we kind of we 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 are. We, we basically have the same level of the evidence of effectiveness that they're working and that we we and understand how how they're working and working well um, it just seems again like there's a ton that people can choose from and it's not it, it's not clear to me which ones are really really exceptional so how do we um, that but but I've, 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 I'm trying to I'm going through a little quickly because I want to get to the a net one um, so math materials any questions on um, uh, achievement net math materials okay I don't either and uh, I'm sorry, I've lost. Are we have professional development practice, development services, best practices in teaching. We're ten point oh six. Six applies to professional development. I, I actually asked all my questions, um, uh, Mr. Conley, uh, prior about this is professional development. The idea that we have all these professional development services. It's like not only vendors, but then also what we're doing internally. How are we tracking? What's working? 
you know, uh, because beyond participant survey and feedback. So, but I don't have any further questions on that. Um, okay, 1401, Teach for America, Teacher Recruitment and Support. Question, Commissioner Hover. Um, so on the next three, to all together, I'm lumping them together. Um, I'm a fan of all three of these programs, but I do have a question regarding um, numbers. Um, I added up the total number of teachers added for each contract, and it comes up to 313 teachers. And I just would like a public explanation for folks to understand if we're going through a system of layoffs, why we're contacting with outside organizations to bring in additional teachers. And I know there's a rationale behind it, but I think the public deserves to understand why, um, because it, could, it would seem concerning to folks who've been laid off that we are now bringing in a whole bunch of new folks to the district. So, um, as we said at the beginning of the, when we started first talking about a reduction in force, that we were redu reducing um, positions um, in some areas, but that we were always going to be hiring in other areas. So there were certain areas that we um, that we always knew that we were going to have vacancies. So um, some of the harder to fill areas, like special ed and um, uh, math and science, are some of the areas we identified. But very early on, we also identified elementary ed as an area we needed folks. So the when we did the layoffs and the rifts, we um, the human capital office very quickly went through every individual, all the um, individuals. Um, in any positions where we were going to do layoffs, to rank them based on the categories allowable under the um, union contract, and to check to see if they had other certifications where we could place them somewhere else. So we tried, we did successfully reduce the RIF significantly by placing as many people as possible in other positions for which they were qualified. But the people that we did lay off, um, and um, in general categories of like guidance counselor and librarians are good examples, were the people who were um, who experienced rifts in those areas or were laid off were largely had um, certifications only in that one area so they are not qualified to fill these other positions so we still have these other positions we need to fill and um, and need help of outside contractors to help fill those positions as we've had for the last several years we've always needed um, some of these pipeline programs to help fill those vacancies yeah, and I appreciate that and I know that I just don't think the public knows that so I'm going to ask the same. Knew. I'm going to yeah. ask the exact same question <laughs> yeah. tonight, just so you know. You yeah. know, so the public can actually hear it at the board yeah. meeting. No, that makes sense because um, it's a. There's a lot of mis, um, misunderstanding in the public, not just in the public, but in our own staff. People That's not right. understanding how schools are staffed, and just because you lay somebody off who's say a guidance counselor or a librarian doesn't mean they're qualified to teach yeah. uh, high school science or even elementary. I mean, that's a specific certification, and if you don't have it, you're not qualified to teach yeah. it. That's right. And I, we had asked for numbers around sort of. Those who were laid off, who actually came back, but I think it'd be it'd be great once once school starts to get a sort of profile for the district, how many new folks we brought in in general. It won't be an apples, it'll be apples and oranges, but just different data points so we understand sort of what we're working with to be helpful. And and I'm correct to say like when I look at this, it's for the recruitment of our next year too. Like we're approving the contract now. It's support for the existing teachers for but we're getting ahead of the curve um yes this is for the and it's, um, for next year as well. and it's yeah. proactive and i think that's a really important no, no, no it reads i read 15 candidates for FY yeah you gotta I, I i miss i read that the same exact way but if you go down to the budget it's for professional development for first year teachers and it's recruitment for 17 18 for the next year um I'm pretty sure it's it's it confused. It's confusing the way it's worded. It's um, confusing the way it's worded. I'll conf I'll make sure we confirm that. But I think that you're right. PD for 1718 and selection for 1718. Selection, the selection for 1718 happens in the spring to start up in FY18. So you know, there's. I will get clear. Make sure we have clarity on around which it is before the meeting. It was confusing. It's confusing. I agree. I agree. It was confusing. Um, my. So, do, any other questions, Commissioner Berkeley, on these? Um, can Can we just talk a second about the funding of UTC? And it's different. We pay. We pay. We pay the Human Capital Offices for BCTR and Teach for America at the levels we say. Um, it was hard for me to understand. Can we just go through how, how, how UTC is funded? 
schools pay a certain amount. I think it's matched halfway, but then it's also how much is it per per member? And then my other question was, um, when we say 70, it, it was hard to determine by the charts who's in which cohort. Um, like, is it is it a cohort of 73, or is that the people within? Is it is it 73 people each year um, that we're bringing in? Is it that over the course of time? I'll get that in here. Actually, I'm going to have Casey come to the table. And, and we can, we, we can uh, I just have questions on funding of how, how yeah. and do we fund these pro, this program differently than Teach for American BCTR and why? That's my first question. Um, hi, Casey Mengel, Special Assistant to the Chief Academic Officer. Uh, so I do think, you know, there's some follow-up that we can do around the exact number that you have there. There is a difference in the way that UTC is funded in city schools, and as you highlighted, it is a match and a shared responsibility between the school to pay for a portion, um, and then there's match uh, for that. The, this year, one of the key pieces that we are doing is aligning a lot of those UTC residents with our priority schools. So the 16 priority schools that have been designated MSDE priority all have a minimum of, well, there are two that have one, and then the rest have at least two um, urban teacher residents in those schools in order to support the literacy initiative um, that we're pushing through our priority schools model. In addition, our lab schools, that lab school model with Mark Martin, each of those schools, I believe, have roughly three. Uh, and then we do, they have what they call like an overseed. So they purchase three or the portions required for three, and then they are allotted one additional resident in that school. Um, I just have, I have a lot of questions on UTC. I'm a yeah. big fan of it, and I think it's, I want to know if how it's effective. I just don't understand the, it's expensive. And the question is, and then we're making schools pay for it, and should we be paying for it? And I just don't know how many we're bringing in. Is it 21? It's a 79. When I, when I, I, I'm, it's a 73. I know I read that, but um, and I, I'm, because there's those multi-year commitments, yeah. and so um, it's 1.8 million for up to 73 residents with 30 C residents at 925 going through the school-based budgets. Um, yeah, w w and is this going tonight, AJ? Is this is not going tonight. Oh, it's not. No, the, the, the Teach for America, the, the Teach three. Teach for America, UTC, um, these last four. Are going Urban Teachers, Baltimore Teacher, yeah, that's the BCTR, we. Teach for America, and Professional I have to double check on PDS, but I think the other three are not going tonight. Okay, Those so. Those contracts aren't signed so yet. So, it, it, the excuse me, the, 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 last, the last four are not going tonight. The last four. Oh, okay. That, that gives us time to actually, I, I'm kind of rushing through because we're late for another meeting, that I could document my questions more clearly and get them answered prior, if that's that would, okay. That would be great. And okay. just the one thing I will say about UTC is that one really important thing that UTC provides is that they, there's all their teachers are dual certified, so they have special ed certification, and their um, teachers tend to stay longer, so they help, fee, they help fill some of those really hard-to-fill vacancies, and then they tend to stay um, longer than some of the other pipeline programs. And, and one question I will have is they're using maps <laughs> with all their teachers to track how they're doing with their students, and so why and when, and I know they probably have to naturally norm because they're in different, that they're having effectiveness, but then is that good for us as a district? But it's in the write-up that they're using maps, and I just want to understand that a little bit more. Um, okay. Um, so I want a motion to adjourn. We are a, a no-no motion. I can just say goodbye. We're done. Thank you all. <laughs> We started. We actually started at nine ten, so we're actually exactly two hours, but we're eleven minutes over. I appreciate. Just so the it. record is clear, we started at nine oh nine. Nine oh nine. Okay, <laughs> two hours and two minutes uh, for the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, AJ. Yes, sir. Thank you.